welcome back to my channel. My name is Tilly and to those of you who are new around here, my channel is all about opening up life behind the lens, exposing the not so perfect life we often don't see on social media. And for me, that has been living with 18 years now of tuberculosis and three years of really unstable adrenal insufficiency. So I hope that if you're living with a chronic illness or you love somebody or care for somebody who is living with a chronic illness, that this channel will be really helpful. So press subscribe and I will be sharing coping strategies, positive thinking, tips and tricks I've learned along the way in terms of dealing with physical and mental symptoms and also sharing my experiences and stories. And this video today is going to be about sharing my adrenal insufficiency journey. I know from one of my previous videos that so many of you have been in touch to say you had a really tough diagnosis journey. And I'm so sorry to hear that as I genuinely do know how that feels. And that will be revealed in today's video. So let's rewind. I had lived with 13 years of undiagnosed active tuberculosis, which had been a huge challenge. I was finally treated on a combination of chemotherapy and antibiotic drugs and I had my life back. I was living my best life. I was living with friends in London. I had a social life. I could exercise. I could work again. Things were going really well. So when a weird array of kind of nondescript symptoms started to present themselves, to start with, I just assumed that it was a case of getting myself back on track. I'd been ill for so long and I knew that my body needed to get fitter, I needed to get stronger, and it was quite normal that I wasn't going to be um, at quite the level that all my friends were at. It would take me a bit of time. The treatment had been tough, I needed to get over it. Um, so I just kind of put it down to that to start with. But over time, more and more symptoms started to be added to this list. And it didn't seem quite right. So what were those symptoms? Well, they were morning nausea. Every morning I'd wake up feeling like I was going to be sick. I wouldn't be able to eat breakfast. I would really eat until the afternoon. I'd wake up every day with a headache. I had very low blood pressure. When I woke up in the morning, I just felt completely and utterly drugged. And I'm not talking about just kind of fancying a bit of a lie-in. I felt like I had anesthetic running through my veins, like I couldn't physically lift my head up in the morning. And I think any of you suffering from Addison's disease or adrenal insufficiency will probably be able to relate to that. I also had leg pains regularly. My digestion, which had got a lot better on the tuberculosis medication, really began to slow. I was extremely weak. I was very pale, um, particularly of a morning. I'd find that all of my symptoms would improve as the day went on. Mornings were my absolute worst. And I also started to suffer from more emotional symptoms, which for me had never been a feature of the tuberculosis years. Whilst physically my life had been very stressful managing physical symptoms, Mentally, I'd actually managed to complete an Oxford University degree whilst living with tuberculosis and while subsequently being on the treatment. Um, I always, I guess, prided myself on the fact that mentally um, I, was, I was extremely resilient. And suddenly I just found that whatever was happening to me now, I was crying all the time for no apparent reason. I couldn't equate it to anything I was thinking or feeling. I had this permanent knot of anxiety in my tummy. Whatever I did, I just couldn't get rid of. And I was really irritable with my family. And despite all the horrible things that had gone on for the 13 years prior to this, I'd always been this carefree, happy-go-lucky, smiley girl. And yes, there were times when I'd felt really upset, really angry that I was having um, all of these horrible things happening to me. This kind of permanent feeling of being low wasn't something that featured for me, but suddenly that was becoming a feature in my life. And it was a culmination of all of these things, which eventually meant I went to the GP um, just to see if he could help and to see if he could had any idea what was going on with me. Whilst my regular GP was really understanding, the first time I went, he said, you know what, you've recently moved into a house with all these friends, you haven't long been off TB treatment, and it will just take a bit of adjustment. Like you're having to adjust to this new life. Um, you're also kind of doing all these things that with the tuberculosis you couldn't do before. And mentally, it's probably just taking its toll on you. Um, so that was the kind of first time I went and that was an explanation, I guess, for why maybe I was a bit emotionally all over the place. I later went back to a different GP and I said, my physical symptoms now are really, you know, getting worse and I don't really know what to do. The list of medications getting longer. All I find I'm doing is taking meds to counteract some of the symptoms like painkillers, anti-sickness, meds to slow down my heart. And it feels a bit like the TB years where 
um, I'm just adding more into the mix, but no one's really getting to the bottom of the problem. And she basically said, you're on too many meds, we need to start cutting some of them. And I was thinking, oh, but I feel awful when I take them, like if I don't take the anti-sickness or I don't take the painkillers, I'm gonna feel really awful. So that wasn't particularly helpful. I then went back to the other GP and I said like this, this thing with kind of coping mentally, it's, this just isn't, isn't getting any better. Um, in fact, it's getting worse. And he eventually said that I, you know, he needed to refer me to a psychologist. Maybe I needed to talk to someone. I'd had so much to cope with over so many years and perhaps that would be helpful. So with open arms, I accepted the referral and I went to the psychologist. Now, <laughs> I think lots of patients with Addison's disease and will be able to relate to this, this kind of stress feeling in their body and also relate to the fact that it's not always picked up by GPs or even by um, psychologists. Um, because cortisol is your stress hormone. So if your body isn't producing that hormone, it is completely natural that you are going to feel overwhelmed and stressed. So I went to the psychologist and her view was I needed to, quote, adapt to life as a well person. And I sat in front of her and I thought, but I feel so ill every single day. Like I'm feeling so ill sitting in front of you right now, like permanent headache, I feel sick, I'm boiling hot, I feel shaky. Um, I can barely make it to the end of the road when I'm walking, I'm so weak. And as always, I kind of went in with my happy-go-lucky smile on my face, um, but, but life wasn't good. And to be fair, she could see past that. She could see that things had been really tough and that my way of dealing with it was, you know, printing a smile on my face and getting on with it. But trying to tell me that I needed to adapt to life as a well person when I was saying, I feel like I'm developing all these physical symptoms again. And ultimately that is what really is getting me down. And also this kind of feeling of stress in my body. She set me some exercises and said I needed to go away. And when I was having these moments of anxiety or moments where I was crying, I needed to write down what I was feeling in those moments. So again, I took it on board, I did it. But I didn't know what to write down because I just suddenly burst into tears. I'd be driving and I'd suddenly burst into tears or I'd be sitting watching TV, watching a program I liked and I'd suddenly burst into tears. I couldn't equate the emotions with any thought that was going on in my head. And my life was beginning to deteriorate. By this point, I'd moved out of the house with the girls and I was living with just one other flatmate and one of my best friends. But it was getting to the point where I felt like I couldn't say to her, that how many things were going on in a day and like I couldn't get up of a morning. I was embarrassed, I was, uh, she'd be there every weekend and I had to set alarms for midday or I literally wouldn't wake. And when I woke at midday, I was completely drugged. I couldn't barely lift myself out of the bed. Um, and I was like embarrassed that this was, this was happening. I was thinking she's gonna think I'm so lazy. One of the really sad things that happened during this time was my relationship also broke down. And this is something I've heard from some of you guys that your undiagnosed Addison's had a real toll on your relationships, your friendships, your family life, because you're feeling so ill, but no one can really understand it. You don't have a label, you don't have a diagnosis, and you just feel like you're starting to go a bit mad. And it got to the point where I was finding it exhausting to even just have a conversation with somebody. So trying to maintain a relationship was proving really difficult. I was finding that I was feeling sick all the time. I was then getting symptoms that developed over time, like terrible ear pain, terrible headaches. I was in pain all the time. Um, I was feeling emotional. I wasn't feeling like I wanted to be doing things. And when you have no explanation for any of that, it's really hard for the people around you to understand. And it was during this time, it was my mum who kept turning around to me and saying, Tilly, you are really ill. I don't know what is going on here, but this isn't right. And you are really ill. You are physically ill and we are going to get to the bottom of this. And we'd had so many years of trying to get to the bottom of the tuberculosis. I was so done with illness. Um, but once again, she was relentless in ensuring that we got to the bottom of this. And she knew there was something physical to blame for how I was acting, how I was feeling. So we started the rounds again. We went to ENT consultants. I had brain scans. We went to cardiologists. We went to rheumatologists. I was told I had glue ear, I had my ear syringe, I had a grommet put in. I had MRI scans on my brain because at one point they were telling me maybe there was a tumour that was pressing and causing these headaches and fluid to come out of my ear. At one point I was being referred for sinus surgery because the headaches at the front of my face were getting so painful. And just two weeks before my first adrenal crisis, I went to see a cardiologist who actually wrote on the form that he wanted to do a test for Addison's disease. Now sadly, his letter didn't come through until after I went into my first crisis. 
In the weeks running up to my first crisis, my life had really deteriorated. I was taking six codeine a day. I was taking three anti-sickness tablets a day. I was taking medication that I'd been prescribed to raise my blood pressure. I was taking medication to slow down my heart rate. I was taking medication to calm down the nerve pain in my head and my ear to try and help me at night. I was taking medication to help me sleep. All this was really doing was masking a problem, a problem that was now really getting out of control. And the day before my first crisis, I couldn't even make it up the stairs to my flat which is something I've seen from my Addison's group again and again. Climbing the stairs has proved a huge feat for people. So much so that one of the lovely girls in our group actually did a charity fundraiser where she climbed her stairs hundreds of times um, now that she was better because that was one of the big things she couldn't do when she was so ill and undiagnosed. I went into my first adrenal crisis um, at around four or five in the morning and my mum recognised the symptoms. When I started displaying signs, which included, um, to start with, I was in pain in my flank, I had leg pains, I was crying in pain with my head, I was dizzy, my blood pressure was very low, I was feeling sick, then I began retching, then I began physically throwing up, having a violent tummy. Then in the end, I was collapsed on the hall floor, shaking uncontrollably. My mum phoned the GP and said, I think my daughter is going into adrenal crisis. And once again, that day, my mum saved my life. The GP said we needed to call an ambulance. The ambulance arrived and gave me, immediately gave me steroid injections. And when I arrived in A&E, thank goodness, there was an endocrinologist in A&E that day. And he turned around to my mum and said, this is an adrenal crisis and your daughter is extremely unwell. I'll be sharing in my next video what the hospital admission and the adrenal crisis actually ended up looking like. I think lots of you will probably be able to relate to my long and complicated diagnosis journey, which went on over an 18 month period and culminated in a very scary episode. And there were other scary episodes, as you might have seen in some of my other videos, for instance, my drink spiking incident along the way. The symptoms I've described today are classic symptoms of adrenal insufficiency, Addison's disease, and when they deteriorate, adrenal crisis. Another one that's a real classic that I haven't mentioned because it was always a bit of a debate with me is tanning. Patients with adrenal insufficiency often develop this, this deep tan and it can lead people to think they look very healthy, very well, but it's actually a sign that your body is struggling to produce cortisol. And one of the other symptoms that patients often experience is salt cravings. Again, not something I've really got, but you actually hear of people like needing to eat salt so badly that they're wanting to put soy sauce on everything. They're eating pickles out the jar all the time. And that often alerts their family to the fact that something a bit weird is happening. I read about one lady whose son was literally stashing salty snacks in his room. And it's not a case of kind of being hungry, but actually just desperate for that salty taste in your mouth. And that's because of how patients with Addison's disease and adrenal insufficiency process salt in the body. It's actually a physical symptom that something is going wrong with their cortisol levels. So again, if you're obsessed with salt and have any of these other symptoms, definitely something worth looking into. I hope you found this video useful. I'd be really interested with any of you suffering from Addison's disease or adrenal insufficiency to comment your diagnosis stories below. It's so useful to share these stories, to get them off your chest and to hear other people's experiences. Press subscribe for future videos.